The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. I'm telling you, we've really got to work on this order of worship thing. Having to follow all these folks that can sing good is not always an envious spot. And Sean, thank you again for filling in this morning. Y'all don't know if y'all, Sean's always the guy you can count on. I don't know, thank you, Sean, for filling in. Matthew chapter 1, we'll be reading verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of the, Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Look, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, speak to us now, Lord, through the pages and words of Holy Scripture. Speak to us words that call us to do or the things you would have us to do, words that call us to be the people you would have us to be, that we may bring glory to your name in this season and every other. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> when I was in the sixth grade, my teacher, Miss Royals, got in the class's attention and she called out a list of names. Now, when a teacher calls out names and doesn't tell you what for, you get a little nervous. But she called out a list of names. Now, I don't remember every name she called, but I remember two. I remember two. One was a girl named Sean Howell. And the other was my name. And while the rest of the class was busy, you know, writing sentences with spelling words or something like that you used to do in the sixth grade, Miss Royals had us come up and she proceeded to tell us that, guess what, you all get to be part of the Christmas program this year. Uh, I was thrilled, as you might imagine. Uh, But she told me, she told us, we're going to be doing sort of a a nativity on the stage, a sort of reenactment. I was 11 years old, uh, not really a Christian myself, was not really uh, versed well enough in the ideas of the separation of church and state. So I was like, sure, whatever. And so what she told us was that Sean would be playing Mary and I would be playing Joseph. It wasn't that hard. I remember she gave me some little thin, flimsy brown thing to put on over. She said, make sure you wear some shorts so your jeans aren't hanging out. She didn't say not to wear socks. I wore white socks and some sandals, a period piece, you know, standing up there. I remember all I had to do was sit on a hay bale. I think I sat there kind of like, you know, a cowboy would, if you get what I'm saying, and sat there for about 20 minutes. Nothing hard, didn't have to sing, didn't have to remember any lines, just had to not fall down and sit on a hay bale. But that may have been the beginning of what has grown into a sort of soft spot for Joseph. You see, Protestant Christians, we don't even really like to talk about Mary too much. We keep Mary at an arm's length. After all, we don't want folks to confuse us with our Catholic brothers and sisters who we incorrectly claim worship Mary. We give her a nod once a year, you know, about this time. We sing songs like, Mary, did you know? Which, by the way, of course she knew. The angel told her first. The angel didn't tell some songwriter, hey, go over there and ask Mary if she knows. No. Just my own little thing. We put Mary out on the lawn. 
hang her on an ornament on the tree. We pay a little attention to Mary at Christmas. But if we pay a little attention to Mary, we don't pay any attention to Joseph. We tend to view Joseph as a sort of superfluous addition to the nativity scene, as if he were our appendix. We don't really know why he's there, don't really know what he does, but he came with a set. (laughs) We don't really sing songs about Joseph. Now somebody after church is going to say, hey, Chris, there's this song about Joseph. I know, but we don't really sing songs about him. In fact, when we set up our nativity sets, you know, this is true. I did this. We bought one for Cole once uh, last year, and I couldn't tell the difference between Joseph and the shepherds. Mary, she's easy to spot. Usually the only woman stands out in blue and white or blue and red. But Joseph, which one is he? You can even buy nativity sets that have the Christ child in Mary's arms. So if you lose Joseph, it's not that big a deal. Why Joseph is even ignored in most of the New Testament only appearing in the nativity stories, only mentioned once or twice. A few times he's referred to uh, in the Gospels, but usually in a sort of derogatory way toward Jesus. Is that Jesus, son of Joseph? Oh, yeah, that's him. He gets about as much screen time as Philip. Go ahead. Who is Philip? He's in there. That's about how much screen time he gets. For most Christians, it seems that Joseph is really just a non-essential character. Only worth mentioning once a year. Only worth mentioning in order to explain who he is. Who's that fella sitting next to Jesus in the, in, the, in the little loft there? Oh, that's Joseph. Why is it one of them shiny guys with the little gifts in his hands? Who, by the way, don't get there, right? Like, that's just another little thing of mine, right? They're not there. Despite how we may feel about Joseph, the truth is he's one of the most important players in the nativity story. Really, I think he's one of the most important figures in the whole of God's story. Because without Joseph, without his devotion to his betrothed Mary, without his obedience to God, the nativity story, the Christ story, could have gone very differently. In fact, Joseph is so important to the story that Matthew, unlike Luke, connects Jesus back to David through Joseph. And then, after all that genealogical stuff we all like to skip because it's got all them hard names in it, Matthew goes on to tell us the rest of the story, short as it is for him, in the text before us this morning. Now we're told in verse 18 of that text, when when Jesus' mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, you know what that means, She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now let me ask you something. How do you think that went over the first time Joseph heard it? I mean, really. Who do you think he heard it from? He didn't hear it from an angel like Mary did. Did Mary come over to the carpenter shop about lunchtime, walk in the place, hey, Joe, Joe, I got something I need to tell you. You're going to want to sit down for this. I don't think you'll believe me. Did Mary run to tell him as soon as she found out? Or was she so frightened of what might happen that she sent a friend, a relative? You're going to have to tell Joseph because I know what he's going to say. I know what he's going to do. I know what's written in the law. So would you tell him? If she were alive today, she may have just sent him a text with emojis in it. Hashtag pregnant. (laughs) Hashtag it's a boy. Hashtag, it's God's. I wonder. Did she hide it from him until she couldn't anymore, carrying larger and larger purses around? I wonder. I don't know. The text, after all, all it says is she was found to be with a child. That doesn't mean they just saw, walk by and go, oh, there's Mary, I found her. No, it means she just was. She just was pregnant. It's not very descriptive. Not descriptive at all, but I can imagine. I can imagine when the conversation happened, it was troubling. One filled with tension and overrun with emotions. I suppose, I suppose some folks might think that today we've grown a little sort of immune, a little used to talking about those kinds of things. After all, we almost celebrate it with shows like 16 and Pregnant. But take a walk down the hall of any high school, and it won't take you long to find out which of the girls are expecting They're usually the ones at the lockers, alone, at the lunch table, alone, 
the back of the class alone. Even the teachers and the parents tend to give them sideways glances as they walk down the halls. There she is, you know what? Mm -hmm. They just try to soak up as much education as they can before inevitably disappearing from school, perhaps eventually having to drop out, take a minimum wage job, and endure a lifetime of criticism for their choices. If it's that hard for such a mother now, you can imagine what it must have been like for Mary to carry that burden. So I wonder how she told Joseph. In the end, I suppose it doesn't matter much how she told him because we have his response right here in the text this morning. Matthew says, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. Now, I suppose if I were cynical about the whole thing, I'd say this is just another example of a man who is free to walk away from a life changed by an unexpected pregnancy while the woman is left to pick up the pieces. But really, for Joseph's context, it's not. You see, Matthew, Matthew only uses one word to describe Joseph. One word, the Greek word diakeos, translated at least in the NRSV, as righteous. Joseph is a righteous man, a man grounded in the law, in the teachings of Scripture, a man who sought to live justly, to do the right thing. And he had every right under the law to cast Mary out, to reveal her condition to the community and shame her. There she is. We're not even married yet and she's already pregnant. Do kick her out, kick her out. It would have been the right thing for him. After all, he wouldn't want word getting out that he had married a woman carrying another man's baby. Can't you just hear the fellows at the job site where Joseph worked? Here comes Joseph. You know, he's raising another man's baby. Hmm, sure he is. Wife got knocked up before they were married. Said it's God's baby. You believe that? God's baby. Poor sap. Probably believes the moon is made out of cheese. I bet she's playing him for all he's worth, too. Can you believe it? Old Joseph, here he comes. I can hear him. I can hear him. It would have been the right thing for Joseph to do, to bring Mary's apparent sins to light in the midst of the community, to call her out for her apparent shortcomings and infidelity. It would have protected his reputation as a righteous man, as a man who lived by the book. Of course, if he had been a literal fundamentalist, he could have gone further. Joseph could have had Mary dragged out before the men of the community and stoned to death. I suppose there might have been some folks who thought that was all right. I can hear their reasoning too. You see, Joseph, the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 22, if there is a young woman, a virgin already engaged to be married, and a man meets her in the town and lies with her, you shall bring both of them to the gate of that town and stone them to death. It's in the book. It's in the Bible, Joseph. So you got to do it. You got to do it. You can't have a woman getting off scot-free from an obvious adulterous encounter. If you don't take a stand, if you don't draw the line, before long, you'll have women sleeping around all over, and when they turn up pregnant, they'll say, oh, it was God's baby. You got to put an end to it now. That's what the Bible says, Joseph. Of course, there are a lot of folks, a lot of folks who like to read Scripture like that, cherry-picking this or that passage in order to justify some egregious action, in order to justify their own comfort, their own selfishness, their own bigotry or ignorance. It's shameful, really, when folks use the Bible that way because they miss the whole point of the whole thing. But thankfully, Joseph, Joseph apparently didn't read the Scripture that way because he doesn't do any of those things. No, Joseph decides to dismiss Mary quietly to give her the option of packing her things, the chance to start life over somewhere else, the opportunity to lay low for a little while until the pregnancy was over. Maybe Mary could pass the child off as her mother's, as the child of a late sibling or cousin. Maybe she'd get away with it if Joseph would just let her slip away quietly and pretend none of this ever happened. That was his plan. And it was a pretty good one. It was a fair plan. But then he went to sleep. 
And Matthew tells us that just when he had resolved to do all these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll bear a son, and you, did you hear that? You are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, the prophet Isaiah. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then Matthew says, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. The angel says, don't be afraid to take pregnant Mary as your wife. And then says, you are to name him Jesus. Joseph has to name him. There won't be some sky-splitting announcement from heaven. You notice that's missing from the story. They don't get to the manger, and when the angels are singing, there's a little record scratch. You go, oh, by the way, his name is Jesus. No. Joseph has to do it. There's no, no, no angelic presence, no mysterious person there to write the name on the birth certificate. It's not up to Mary. Joseph is told to do it. Now, it's easy to get caught up in the name Jesus and the meaning there from the Hebrew Joshua, which means Yahweh saves, and lose sight of the importance of what it means for Joseph to name the child. Because you see, if Joseph names the child, that means Joseph claims the child, he claims responsibility for the child, that he claims the baby as his own to raise to nurture, and to look after. This may be the most radical thing put forth by the angel to Joseph in his dream. I mean, really. Joseph is told to claim the child as his own, to give him the name Jesus, to stop in, to step in, where so many others would have bowed out. It's radical not only because of the immense responsibility that comes with caring for a child, not only because of the nature of the very child in Mary's womb, but because it goes so strongly against what Joseph had been taught through the scriptures. He was supposed to expose an engaged woman pregnant with someone else's child, not marry her. He was supposed to have such a woman stoned to death, or at least have her and her unborn child removed from the community, not take her in, not care for her, not name the child as if it was his very own. That's not in the book. That's not in the book. But you know, sometimes we get so caught up in what we think is in the book that we overlook what the whole book is about. Sometimes we get so caught up in trying to find a text here or a verse there to get out of a difficult situation that we ignore the voice of God calling us deeper into that very situation. Sometimes we get so caught up in trying to justify our positions and convictions with the words of Scripture that we miss out on the very living Word of God among us. And you see, I know some folks who, who had they been in Joseph's place, would have argued with the angel in this dream. Really. Angel would have said, now Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Whoa well, now, whoa well, now, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. You're telling me going to marry her? To name the baby too, you must not read the same Bible I do. Because the Bible's clear about such things. You know, I bet there's some folks, when, when, when heaven gets to them, that they're going to be standing in line, and Jesus is going to come, and they're going to say, Hey, Jesus, come here, come here. You see them folks down there? They ain't supposed to be here. But I think there will be folks who will argue with Jesus. We need to set you straight, Lord, on all this love your neighbor business. Because you don't know my neighbors. Well, I bet there are folks today, just as there were then, if Jesus himself walked through the front doors of the sanctuary, stood in the pulpit to declare the arrival of God's kingdom, as soon as he'd walk out, they'd go, now what do you think he really meant? They'd argue with him. Would you believe there are even folks in this world who would keep food out of a hungry mouth because they think the Bible says it's the right thing to do? It's true. There are people who call themselves Bible-believing Christians who use the Bible to justify all manner of things from the denial of proven medical procedures 
to ignorance surrounding issues of the environment and even their own discomfort and hatred of those things different from themselves. And they'll do it all the time going, it's in the book. It's in the book. Imagine if Joseph had done that. I'm certainly glad he didn't. I, for one, am glad that Joseph, a righteous man, remember, believed most not in the traditions handed down to him, but in the love that is foundational to understanding the very nature of God. A love that does not cast a young woman and her unborn child into the spotlight of shame. A love that does not hold so tightly to the conveniently contrived proof text of the Bible that grace and redemption cannot find their way through. I'm glad. I'm thankful that Joseph believed in a love that shows the way to God more fully than any string of chapter and verse citations used in one's defense of discrimination and ignorance. For it's that great love of God that we celebrate this season. A love that says to all of us that in spite of our sins, in spite of our selfishness, in spite of our repeated rejection, in spite of everything we do that stands in direct opposition to what God calls us to be, God still longs to be with us. That in spite of every, every wrong choice we make, in spite of all those things that others may point and say, it's in the book and you were wrong, in spite of all of that, God still comes to be with us. And that us Maybe I shouldn't have to say this, but maybe I should. That us doesn't mean me and the people I like. That us means all of us. All. That's what it says, isn't it? They shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is with us. In spite of every well-meaning way we try to keep God from others and ourselves, God is still with us. And thanks be to God that he is. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, the one who was and is and is to come. Lord, help us to see in this season when it is so easy to be caught up in selfishness, to see in times in our lives when it is so easy to point the finger and cast the stone. God, that you have come to be with us. And Lord, that you call us to share the love that you give to us so freely to all who may cross our path. Help us, Lord, as we gather with friends and family in this coming week, as we make our way back to this place to worship and celebrate your birth. God, remind us of the love you have for us. Remind us in tangible ways as we gather with friends and family in the spirit we feel. Remind us through your words. Remind us through your presence. Then, Lord, challenge us and encourage us to see that that love is not something we keep to ourselves, but it is love that only grows as we give it away. So Holy Spirit, be with us now, stir in our presence, help us, Lord, to move in whatever ways you would have us to move. In your holy name we pray, amen.